Thank you for coming this evening. I'm Cheryl Sprates, and I'm the co-president of the Longmont branch of the American Association of University Women. Tonight, I will be um, introducing our esteemed panel members. Um, I think we're very fortunate to have a group like this assembled together. So I'm looking forward to all we can learn tonight. I'll introduce our, oh, please hold your applause until um, the end of the whole presentation. And I also have cards here for anyone who's interested in asking a question. We'll have a little bit of time at the end, but we can all also get you an answer um, via email. So um, if you are interested in asking a question, please raise your hand. Um, the first person I'd like to introduce is Marsha Martin. Um, she has represented Ward 2 of the Longmont City Council for six years. She holds a master's degree in computer science and enjoyed a 40-year career as a systems engineer before retiring in 2013 from the clean energy sector. She finds that serving on the City Council is a natural con continuation of her career. Her strongest interests now involve re-engineering cities as sustainable systems of distinct but interdependent components, just as we are doing with the generation, transmission, and distribution of electricity. In both systems, failure is not an option. Uh, Marsha? Thank you, Cheryl. everybody hear me okay and I don't have I don't have houses on my face or anything <laughs> yeah. okay so I was asked to talk about Envision Longmont which is uh, the city of Longmont's uh, comprehensive um, multimodal and uh, plan multimodal and land use plan um, and uh, it was adopted by a former city council. I don't think there's anybody left from that city council in 2016. Uh, and if you think about how a document like that gets written, that means that it was under construction in 2014 and 2015, which means that they were working from a flood racked, destroyed, city because of the flood of 2013. So they were looking instead of just an extension to the old plan, they needed repair, recovery, and rebirth. And they saw it as a method of, of uh, uh, getting a fresh start and being, being creative. So that's, that was the intent of Envision Longmont. I should have been on this slide the whole time. So, <laughs> so uh, it's expected to live uh, for 10 to 20 years, except that this summer we will enter year nine. So it's been our guiding principles for a long time, um, maybe for longer than was reasonable, because um, I'll talk about a number of things that have already changed even though we didn't update the, formally update the comprehensive plan, and also some things that really need to change in order to um, keep Longmont both livable and equitable and economically viable. Because for the city to work, all three of those have to remain true. Um, so the comprehensive plan identify uh, these policy elements, and I'll let you read them while I yabber. Um, <laughs> certainly the main elements of urban design and planning are here, with one notable exception, and I'm gonna let you guess until the end of the presentation what the, what the left out piece is, because it's a really important one, but it didn't seem important at, in, in 2016, and it really didn't seem that important in 2013. Um, the bullets above are direct quotes from the front matter in Envision Longmont. It's in some ways a marketing document. What I, when I began learning it, I was puzzled that it 
doesn't seem to communicate a sense of urgency. Um, it doesn't seem to have any impact analysis. It doesn't seem to, um, you know, just, just get into the process of how we're actually going to get this done. And uh, I can only conclude that the community was shocked and that it was mostly a marketing document and the, and one, uh, the, the biggest goal was to have a message of hope. And certainly that is true of Envision Longmont. It is a, a beautiful little book with great photos of Longmont in it. But, you know, it's, it's hard to use it to get behind the city and push. So we're out, uh, is, is one of the policy elements of uh, policy and then growth um, that, that uh, Envision Longmont looks at. Um, and, and I think that at the time that that was done, you know, we had first come off of the Great Recession, and then we'd come off a whole string of, of uh, annexations, and uh, really the real estate development market in those early years was the only commercial economic engine we had. So uh, I think that those developers may have gotten away with some stuff, um, but they're still important to Longmont. Uh, what I think people are mistaken in doing now is that they are equating that kind of sprawly suburban uh, development that happened between Main Street and the foothills as, as what growth means, and it doesn't. You know, and um, if you look at the needs under growth, you'll notice that population growth isn't in there. We don't have any particular aspirations for, um, for population growth. What we do have is we want housing for um, several sets of people. We want housing for uh, children of residents that are either aging out of foster care or just reaching adulthood in their own families uh, and they want to have their own place to live and work, but they don't want to leave the town where they grew up. That's kind of a nice sentiment, isn't it? And that's how we're going to keep Longmont from being, one way we're going to keep Longmont from being an aging community. Um, families who are inadequately housed because the family has grown or because the family has not been able to upscale their residence from, you know, they bought or rented the, the cheapest starter thing they could find and they, they're outgrowing it. Those people need to be able to change housing just as seniors need to be able to downsize. Um, and it'd be great if you could rotate uh, housing among, among those groups, except that uh, downsizing is so expensive that you don't end up with, with uh, any, any you know, retirement fund out of doing it, which used to be the expectation, you know, that you, you downsize into something less costly um, and provide big houses for families at the same time. And we have a lot of people who have jobs in Longmont, and these tend to be the lower wage earners in Long, in, uh, you know, in this, in the tax region. Um, but they, they have jobs in Longmont, good jobs in Longmont, but they have long commutes because those jobs are not good enough to live in Longmont and especially not to own property in Longmont. So that's something that we need to change. Is if you think about what a tax commuting is on those people, you know, $10,000 a year on the car, maybe two hours a day, five days a week out of their lives, you can't count the cost of, of uh, the time not spent with families and hobbies and just general relaxation, self-care. Um, and the other side of that coin is that workers who have not studied that, have suffered that stress, are happier, more interested in their job, and giving you, the Longmont residents, better service on that account. So it's really an important thing to have as many of Longmont's workers live here as possible. But that's not really growth, not like population growth, because 
uh, you know, those people still drive in Longmont. They still may shop in Longmont, and it would be better if they did. Uh, and and uh, you know, they fill slots. They they have employment slots in the city, so they're really already part of Longmont. Um, and then, you know. We may have uh, support our, our primary employers, you know, the big guys from Left Hand Brewery to Seagate, um, who occasionally want to really hire from outside the area because if they want to hire a specialist. And we've made that a difficult problem for them because it's hard for them to buy houses. Almost everywhere in the United States, housing is less expensive and easier to find than it is here. So that's gonna be a trickle of people. It's not, not gonna be a vast impact on uh, the population of Longmont. I want everybody to understand that. Um, implementation strategies. You know, there's really only two big implementation strategies for um, squeezing 120% of a city into the same space that you had the original city. Um, you can uh, change your land use policies, which means squeezing more dwellings into the same place and uh, stacking up your um, amenities so that the land is used, the, you know, the same footprint of land is used for multiple purposes. Um, we're, we're constrained by our open space policy, and you'll see in a future, next slide, that, um, that that ring of constraining open space is just about complete. So there's there's not really much opportunity to expand Longmont's footprint. We're in the process of annexing the things that are still annexable right now. Um, so you change density, and you have to you have to find ways to put what's needed uh, into uh, the space you have. Um, and what that does is, is it requires you to improve the design, the mobility design, the design that it takes to get people around your city. And one of, the, one of the best things that you can do is make it possible and encourage people to drive less. Now, this is the United States. You can't outlaw automobiles. Um, you can't take them away from people. You can't really tax them, um, you know, except, except for things like sales taxes. But um, you know, we don't have road taxes or anything much like that. And uh, people who have driven all their lives and, and don't, I trust me, they don't really imagine that there's any other way, a lot of them. Uh, but what we want to do is make the people who are open to changing their habits able to change their habits. Because you have to be really tough to buck the system and become, for example, a bike rider for your commute and, and everything. If the city isn't designed for cyclists, uh, right now our city isn't designed by cyclists. And I will submit that although we are adding to the uh, multimodal network is what it's called, uh, uh, a pace, we aren't doing it in such a way that gets uh, all of the bikeways well connected. So, you know, you're fine on a nice bike path and then all of a sudden you're taking your life in your hands to get to the next buffered bike lane in the city. Um, so uh, we need transit corridors. What does that mean? You, we didn't explain it. I know, I didn't. <laughs> do I have any more minutes? Have do I? Minute. I have a minute. Oh boy. Okay. So does that mean speed up? Yeah, it does mean speed up, actually. Um, so, oh. <laughs> well, now I've lost half a minute just giggling. Um, so, uh, you know, we have to do these implementation strategies smart and we have to really think harder about what they mean to our community. This is the Longmont planning map in 2016. This is the one out of Envision Longmont. And so 
what, what you want to think about is you can see the green periphery that that's the open space buffer and you can see that there are very few ways to do it and there's a line that there's a blue line that's hard to see which is the Longmont planning area and that means Longmont's going to have a hard time um, expanding out of that and probably shouldn't expand out of that um, the yellow is all single-family zoning uh, and then the red areas of change are commercial areas where we can make major improvements with with code and parking and land use and stuff like that. And then the peripheral red are also things that weren't annexed yet in 2016, and some of them still aren't. So the, this is actually the slide that I wanted to spend most of my time on. Um, and. Uh, that it shows, so if you can, you know, you put your speed readers on, um, it shows what it says in, in vision in the left hand column, and then what has changed since then or what needs to change since then. So um, we've already made some changes in density, and the slides will be available too, at least mine will, um, if you ask. And uh, um, uh, you know, we've, we've allowed building on smaller parcels of land, we've allowed narrower streets, um, but we need that space for bike lanes, um, we've um, changed the parking rules. All of that stuff <coughs> is really essential to, uh, you know, squeezing 120 pounds of long pond in, into an 80 pound bag and making it work. You know, that's making it work with good urban design. It can work and it has to work because it, all of these things are needed for a, a robust economy that will continue into the future. And the one word that was not mentioned in Envision Long Run at all, and everybody just needs to think about that, is energy. Because the city didn't really have any serious energy policy um, in 2016 other than, you know, keeping the water clean yeah. and stuff like that. But uh, now we do, and it's a big deal. And amazingly enough, it's one of the ways we regain space with a, that can, we can repurpose it. So I'll be around for, oh, we can't be around for questions, can we? Okay. But well, people have cards and things, and we can okay. give them to you so yeah. you can answer them. Okay. okay. Thank you. You're did you take my paper with the introduction? <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks, Marcia. Sure. I never quite understood Envision Long Run, and I understand it better now. Yeah, Thank it took you me for two that. years. So, yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> um, our next panelist is Brian Dunmar. He's Executive Director of the Institute for the Built Environment, IBE and Professor of Air Emeritus at CSU, where he has taught courses in construction management, interior architecture, and sustainability. He holds degrees in architecture from the University of Michigan. Through IBE, he has guided project work for the National Park Service, cities, universities, housing authorities, and school districts. He is co-author of Whole School Sustainability, and 147 Tips on Teaching Sustainability. His research and teaching about sustainable building has been honored by the Colorado governor, communities, and businesses. Brian will help us understand the promise of design charrettes and how charrettes benefited the recent bond farm conceptual development. Now, I've been floating all over things. Good evening, everyone. Um, and Sarah and Cheryl, thanks for the invitation to be part of this. It's uh, a pleasure to be back in Longmont. Uh, and you're, you're doing some really good things in Longmont, and so uh, it's nice to be able to see that evolution. So what I'm gonna uh, quickly talk about is this strange word called charrette. Um, and it's a word that architects have used for couple centuries now and it really it's a French word and as you can see it, it means cart so why why am I talking about carts tonight well 
architecture professors used that term at the Ecole de Beaux Arts in Paris, and now we have brought it across the pond and we use it often both in architecture school and in community planning and, and uh, architectural offices and others. And it really just means a community design workshop where everyone's voice matters. Early on, it meant that the professor was going to give you 24 hours to get your design done, and he or she was going to bring the cart, and you're going to finish your work. So, like that drawing there, the student jumped into the cart and finished their design work uh, as the professor came along to grab it. But why, why are we talking about that, and, and why does uh, it matter? Well, a shred is a good way to, to kick off a process, to bring everyone together and hear different points of view. And it does end up providing some really nice alignment and, and finding common ground. Uh, it helps to form collaboration, collaboration teams, and then to uh, allow that the best design ideas to come out. And it really ends up kind of like that. Like here we are all kind of networking and working together, uh, even if we start in different places. So I wanted to also just say that um, our institute at Colorado State has used the Charette process since we were created 30 years ago. This is our 30th anniversary. And we've been helping communities in, in Colorado and, and other states and sometimes other countries using this process to help them advance both a building project or a development project or sometimes just an organizational change like strategic planning. So it's that idea of bringing people together. And we set out the goals early on so everybody knows where we're trying to go during this process. It might be four hours, it might be a whole day, it might be a few days. And then the Bond Farm Project we had one charrette that was two days long, and I think it needed to be to end up with some of the results that came out. So we set out the goals, like find common ground and understand what's coming next, but what are other goals that the group uh, believes in? And another really important thing is early on, we set out the rules of engagement. And when we do this, this helps us all work together. Like, I might have come into the room saying, I have a certain purpose for being here and I'm going to make sure that my idea is brought out. But once I understand this and I start behaving as a the group process, it changes the, the atmosphere and the culture of the room to allow people to say, okay, this is a big project and we're working together and I have, I can contribute to it rather than I can get my one point across and so those rules of engagement really come out and we we often say let's have a good time like this is it's important work and let's have a good time if we smile while we're doing the work i bet the work comes out better and usually does and I, I show this because what happens a lot of times is we are we start a project and you get some ideas and then people want to say okay now we're done but what I emphasize during my, uh, when I facilitate a shred is this grown zone, and we can smile and laugh about it, is the time that the ideas, the best ideas continue to come out. Some good ideas might have happened here, but don't shortchange the process. If we really want to get a great result, let's go through that grown zone together. And again, so many new ideas are brought out if you have the time, and that's why we like those longer uh, charrette ideas. So we start out as a larger group and then we break into smaller subtopic groups and this is where everybody gets to be involved. You know sometimes if you're in a larger group you hold back and you don't give out all your ideas or you feel like everybody else is talking but when we get into the smaller groups six to eight people that's when everybody has their voice and can come out and I always ask for table facilitators to make sure that everybody is being heard and no one is dominating the conversation. 
and that really helps the process move along as well. Uh, this is an example of uh, during the bond farm the second day. So the actually we had we had three different major charrettes during the bond farm process. We had what we call a visioning charrette. Let's get the big ideas out. Let's hear what the developer had in mind in the first place and let's hear other visions for the project. And then we end with a design charrette. But I want to say that the planning and zoning uh, department and planning and zoning uh, authority in Longmont was very wise during this project which had contention to say let's have a, a sort of a middle charrette called a compatibility charrette. It was the first time I've been involved in that process and it was the right thing to do. Uh, it helped to bring more ideas together. Compatibility, hey, let's be compatible. And it was compatibility between a new development and surrounding older neighborhoods. Um, as I said, we've been doing this process for 30 years and I had a student, Catherine, who was uh, a graduate student. She had been on the volleyball team at CSU, and that's a really successful volleyball program. And Catherine knows the importance of teamwork. So when she was asked to do a thesis, she said, I'm gonna do it on the Shrek process, because that's all about creating teamwork. And so what she found during the process is that charrettes allow more ideas to be generated it actually speeds up the process. It, it sounds like it might take a while if I'm asking everyone to spend a day or two, but it would be drawn out without the short process. So it adds up saving time and money, and it really creates some nice project awareness. And during Catherine's research, she also found, because she surveyed projects across the country and found that this these were the ideas that came out as really important ideas like obtain, obtaining buy-in. Certainly that's an important thing uh, in the process. And then uh, at the end of Catherine's research, we did, remember David Letterman? It's been a while. Well, Catherine was a student a while ago. So, so these were the things that came out of Catherine's research. Remember, he always did it from 10 to, to 1. But let's have many charrettes. Make sure your ego isn't part of this. Uh, understand the local resources. Make sure everyone's participating. Uh, make sure we have clear goals. Uh, someone's got to be in charge of taking it from that time. So it's not just a fun event that had good ideas, but it keeps it going. And then the facilitator must be versed in this process of planning and, and design. Make sure all the voices are there. If they're not there, I sort of want to pause the thing and say, we got to get more more of those uh, perspectives in there. And then let's have some fun. So those are the, the, the main things that came out of our uh, process. And so to conclude, I, uh, just a couple thoughts. Um, one is when we finished the compatibility charrette for the Bond Farm Project, the planning director for the city of Longmont said, we should do this process for all or most of our projects. And so I, I was really pleased to hear the director of planning say that. And then when the planning, uh, the project was presented to planning and zoning, and then again to city council, I don't know, Marcia, if you maybe heard the word charrette before and you knew about it, but some of the people both in planning and zoning and city council had not really used the word. And during the evenings, and they were long evenings, I kept score of how many times the word charrette was used, and in both the planning zoning and city council, it was over 60 times wow. that people said charrette, but it mostly came from city council and the planning zoning people. And I think there was acknowledgement that, yeah, this really helped the project along. And um, so I want to encourage all of you to consider this process, whether it's for a remodel of a home or a new building or a renovation to a school in town, or even something like a strategic plan for a business or for, or for a neighborhood. Um, you never know the results of a charrette before you go in, but I, I can say you will always know that it's synergistic. 
And another way to say that, uh, that I heard from uh, someone wiser than me one time was, uh, no one of us is as smart as all of us. And I think that the charrette really brings that out. And I just want to, as I leave, I want to say, who was involved in the Vine uh, Farm charrette processes? Go ahead and raise your hand. So we have, as you can see, three of our, four of our speakers, and Dan and Sarah, and that's one of the reasons that we're here is because Sarah participated. And then Katie is a student at Colorado State University. She lives in Longmont, and she helped to facilitate the process. And then, Mike, nice to see you. Anyway, that's all I have to say, and uh, let me know if there's questions along the way. Okay. Thank you, Brian. Um, our next speaker is Drew Sorrells. Drew is a seasoned um, interior designer specializing in creating sacred lifelong places that honor both body and soul with a strong emphasis on connecting interiors to the natural world. Her career has largely focused on residential and commercial design, along with a few community-driven projects. Drew's first neighborhood development involvement began serendipitously with the Bond Farm Project, located just a stone's throw from her home. Today, Drew will share how the organic involvement and concern for her community has opened doors to numerous other opportunities. I'll pretend you're all clapping. <laughs> <laughs> we are. Hi everybody, and thanks for adding to my little bio there. That was great. Um, so, and thank you all for being here and speaking. I um, want to share my experiences um, in my involvement, involvement in the Bond Farm development and also as a, a way to encourage all of you women to get out there <laughs> and be a part of your community and how this project has actually really opened doors up for me. Um, so I am a Colorado native. I have lived in Longmont for about 28 years and my interior design firm has been in existence over 40 years and I've pretty much just worked on residential and commercial design and kept my nose to the grindstone focusing on sustainability and it really wasn't until I heard about the Spawn Farm project that I started getting really involved in my community. Um, I knew a little bit about the Bond Farm and what was being developed before Mark Young um, started developing this property. It was, it was um, being developed as a co-housing project and so I knew that one of our neighbors had invested in that project and a recent friend that I just met through Brian Charles Irvin also invested and Charles was he's um, a mortgage lender for rural housing focus on rural housing and health care and he was sort of coaching me along this way when he found out that I was really interested in making a difference in this project and basically he was agreeing with me that we need to find somebody to snag snag up this land and buy it from Mark because his concept plan was really pretty mercenary, like just rows of townhomes with no character. Um, so we actually looked for someone to buy the property, and it was um, it was it was um, a dead end. And so I asked him, Charles, what are we going to do? And he said, the only way you're going to make a change in the direction of this development is to work with somebody like Brian who understands the process and can help the community understand the potential of this development. So my husband and I, who's in the audience, Dan, um, joined the neighborhood. We had been part of the neighborhood group and we felt like it was a good idea to uh, create a liaison between the neighbors and the uh, developer, Mark Young. And Mark Young, with his uh, kind of tainted reputation, it was really 
hard not to just lean into that bad reputation and see him as a as a criminal guy but we <laughs> we ended up having many meetings with him brian had a meeting with him and we um decided that you know everybody has a good side and he was doing the best that he could in this development so we basically twisted his arm to engage in a charrette he wouldn't even pay for it and but he agreed to do it with conditions and one of his conditions was i'm gonna um, limit the amount of people that can come to this thing because he just didn't want to get bombarded so then so it's the day of the charrette and he's calling brian dunbar in the morning and he's saying brian why do i have to do this <laughs> and brian is like mark it's okay we're in this together you know what your goals are it's for the greater good this is going to be fine and mark showed up with bells and whistles at the charrette so the visionary charrette was uh i think very successful so we created a neutral ground for people to express their um, opinions and desires and how they wanted to see the neighborhood um, there were outside professionals invited that gave a different perspective to Mark's development team. And uh, one of the funniest things was, you know, I, was, I had sent out all the invitations, I knew who was coming, and there were four people showing up that I had no idea who they were, and he's one of them. And he's one of them. <laughs> and it ended up being, you know, it's like, I gotta just let this go. And it ended up being a really good thing because they brought a, a different perspective, which was pro density. And we had a lot of people that were anti density. And it kind of balanced out the group. So after the charrette, Dan and I, my husband, decided, you know, I think we need to take a pretty neutral position here. We decided uh, not to be really for or against anything that was going on, but more take a supportive position, continue the charrettes, support, you know, the whole activity that's going on and let the outcome be the outcome. Um, so there was such opposition uh, for this development and Mark Young presented his concept plan to planning and zoning and he, and he, he didn't pass and Brian uh, talked about how the planning and zoning was recommending that we define compatibility in a second charrette and that's exactly what we did and then have the third charrette um, that was the design charrette and voted on the winning concept plan which the architect was actually part of that team that came up with a winning concept plan and um, Mark presented that to the planning and zoning and city council and he introduced it as I like this concept plan better than what my architects came up with and which was pretty remarkable um, so one of the things, some of the things that we gained from that um, exercise is a variety of housing types instead of just rows of townhomes, single family homes, duplexes, um, townhomes, more open space, uh, sensitivity to the scale and the design so that the design is more compatible with the, the existing neighborhood some opportunity for a live work situation in in the housing it we ended up actually with less density which um, some of the neighbors really wanted um, walking paths play areas for kids safe streets the opportunity for community gardens and um, we talked a lot about mature landscaping and needing that so that the neighborhood could fit into um, the existing, the bond farm could fit into the existing neighborhood. So, planning zoning passed, city council passed, yay, and it's not over. <laughs> um, so that was a big hurdle to get over. And now, 
Stan and I are part of Shaquille's organization, Launch Longmont Housing, and we can join forces in supporting the development of this um, of, of this project for Mark Young and other projects too. So we're not just two people doing this, we're in a bigger community in Launch Longmont Housing making these efforts. So you, I can't wait to hear what Shaquille has to say tonight. So the beauty of all this is I am not a spring chicken and at my age, most women would be thinking about retiring. But for me, I have flipped a coin and pretty much started a whole new um, slant on my career. And a lot of that has opportunity has come about because of working for the first time with Brian Dunbar. I've um, joined the, a membership with the United States Green Building Council. I've gotten my lead green associate credential. I am working with Brian's Institute for the Built Environment in their Lifelong Communities and Lifelong Homes initiative, which is so important. It um, is basically guidelines and a certification process to teach developers, architects, and builders how to create communities that support aging in place. So accessible and accessible dwelling parks and walking pathways in a neighborhood and also the healthcare services coming to that neighborhood so super important to have like people thinking about i don't have to ever go to a nursing home i can live in this community for the rest of my life so and one last little thing i want to give you um for all the women so all the men you can Go, la, 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 la. <laughs> um, a couple of weeks ago, I was at the United States Green Building Council's um, sponsored event called Women in Green, and we were all there to be um, to learn about what these women are doing in the world of sustainability with the government and private practices. And it was also addressing some of the insecurities that women have in this field. And so anyway, long story short, one of the, um, my favorite quotes that was given during that meeting is, women, stop thinking about how your words might impact everyone in the room and speak your mind openly. <laughs> Thank you, Drew. I love all these different perspectives. It's wonderful. Our next speaker is Doug Jones. He and his family have long lived in Old Town Longmont, formally, formally trained as an architect at CU Boulder. He now works for architects and other small businesses to help guide their way through information technology. Doug sees the design process as a community investment and is always thinking about ways to bring about great designs. Good evening, and thank you for having me. Thank you, Cheryl and uh, Sarah, and all of you at AAUW. Um, I'm happy here to, to speak about um, my experience as one of Bond Farm Neighbors group people. Um, can you hear me okay? Thank you. Is that better? Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm immensely proud of our neighborhood and all the participation and caring that went into um, understanding and shaping the current iteration of what happened with the bond farm. I think we did a, I think we did a good job and we, and with the help of all these people over here, we had some really good involvement and some really good, uh, some really good conversations and understanding what's going on there. Having lived in the neighborhood for over 20 years, I'm not just invested in my neighborhood in Longmont, but it's my home and being a per person who cares deeply about design, I want to see any changes that happen there be good changes, right? So in a nutshell, what brought our, it's, that's what brought our core group together, is all these people wanting something better for our neighborhood. And as Drew kind of alluded to in the beginning, what we first saw was a little scary when we first saw that. And we were, you know, we were not impressed. We were shocked that such a drastic change could possibly be happening in our neighborhood. We were rightly concerned what might end up in our backyard. We, felt uninformed about the process and about what 
you know, could that possibly go there? What, you know, we didn't know anything. We, we were typical neighbors. We didn't want change, right? We don't want more things happening that we don't understand in our neighborhood. We wanted to protect our investments. We wanted to, you know, what we saw didn't look like a peaceful neighborhood that we bought into. Um, we understood Longmont was growing, however, and we needed to change and adapt to that growth. Because does that really mean, you know, this one house with a couple people and a couple cars was going to turn into hundreds of houses with hundreds of people and hundreds more cars? You know, that's a daunting and you know an exciting prospect too, right? So. Um, and we didn't understand the development process or the planning process. So all that stuff, you know, we just had to kind of take in and say, well, what are we going to do? So like every like-minded group of people do, we got our heads together, we talked about it, we researched it, and we came up with some ideas. And the first thing we did was uh, we took a look at all the information that we had at hand. So like Envision Longmont, code, precedents of other developments, historical data, previous owners, the council, the planning department, and we just pummeled those people and those sources for information constantly. And we learned as much as we possibly could. The main document that we looked at was Envision Longmont, right? Because that is supposed to inform and guide us to that. And we came to realize very quickly that Envision Longmont is well, it's a great, and like Marcia said, I think it's, I'm just impressed that uh, we are we are somewhat in agreement on some things. <laughs> that, um, <laughs> that that document is, it's a great picture book, and it's a great vision. It's kind of a wordy vision statement for Longmont, but there's no design in it. There's no game plan inside that document. And that is what Longmont is severely, severely lacking in Marcia. Um, alluded to that, and that's where we, I completely agree with her. Um, we also held charrettes, um, as Drew and Brian talked about, that was very informative for our group. Our group was highly resistant to the charrette idea, as much probably as Mark's group was. There were some of us that were uh, knew that that process could really work, me being an architect, I understand the whole cart idea. I was one of those kids on the cart <laughs> during going through school, so I get that, right? Um, uh, and then what we did was each time the development came up in planning or council, we were all there armed with our five minute speeches ready to just give them help, right? So that's that was my experience with this whole process, and it was a really good experience. But we were left to wonder kind of, is all this really sinking in? Are we making a difference here? Are we actually doing what it is that we need to do to make this process change. For example, like, is the planning commission and, and, and city council actually reading all those emails that we sent to them? Are yes. they are they reading and seeing all of the, you know, the documents that we're sending into them? I mean, it turned out to be hundreds and hundreds of pages of information. And the poor planning commission, they get that information about four or five days prior to the process so they have you know mere days to process all that information is this the best way that we can do to go about putting projects out there do we need to be sitting here debating envision long run and the interpretation of that plan on every single project every time we come up into it there's a different group of people listening to you every single time do we have to sit there and debate where's the traffic going where's how's the density going we need, in long run, and this is kind of the point of my speech tonight, we need to have a design in place, at least some basics that say, here's here's where we're going with long run. We don't need to figure out where, you know, what the what the parking size looks like in, in Bond Farm neighborhood. We need to figure out a true multimodal plan for long run. Envision like 10 or 12 east-west corridors and 10 or 12 north-south corridors and bike lanes that people can use to get to and from and around Longmont. Why don't we plan that, stop development or do anything, have a charrette process and plan all that out so that we can figure out those kind of basic core bones of the city and then build around that kind of thing. 
because we're spending our precious five minutes in front of city council, in front of planning, sitting there going, well, do I talk about the parking space or do I talk about the fact that I want to have my kid go safely to school, yeah. right? So these are things that the city, you know, as Marcia had said, we have, um, we're coming up on, what is it? Nine. Nine years for Envision Longmont. So if, you know, every 10 to 20 years, the city does this. Sure, let's revisit the Envision Longmont. Let's enhance it and make it better and expand that vision. But then let's take that next step and let's design something that the city can be proud of and move forward with. So that is my goal for this, um, for this group of people to kind of get that bug under your bonnet and like really go out there and find something to hang your hat on and, and push Longmont forward in that direction. There's, there's two reasons why that's really important and they all kind of bounce back to Bond Farm. So the first one is that um, when the park, when Bond Farm property was annexed in, um, well, and it, let me back up just a little bit. In the Longmont Code, it says that park space for for neighborhoods needs to be one acre per 200 single family homes. So in the Bond Farm area, we're about 300 homes, give or take, lots of single family, lots of multifamily, things like that. We're about at a three acre deficit of parks. So when that when that property came in with its six acres, three acres really should have come into the city as a park. And that never happened. They allowed 0.85 acres to do that. Had we a plan, a design that already said, here's multimodal, here's parks, here's the things that we adhere to, we could have already had a park ready to be designed and accessed by the time that came in. And that thing could be under development right now, not having to wait for this development to pass and then wait another 10 years for it to be funded. So that's one thing that we could, that could help. The other thing is the annex of Francis Street down from Spruce Avenue. It's that dirt road, if you're not familiar with the area, right off of, right off of Spruce Avenue going, let me out, north, south, south. south going south down the road. And that was annexed in because the property at the bottom of the street adjacent to Bond Farm wanted to tag in and annex into um, to Bond Farm. When that happened, they the city chose to annex in Francis Street itself, and that created an access point potential for Bond Farm property, right? So Mark has done all this work, we've done all this charrette work, everything's pushed through the city, you know, everybody's pretty much at a happy place with this, and now we have a new piece of information coming in that takes the park that Mark put on the west side of the property and wants an annex through that, so it takes that 0.85 acre park and it slices through it, and now Mark has to change his design. So again, that's my point about let's get something together. We have to have designs. We just can't have visions. They don't, visions are great, we need to push through designs, and that's just two two areas in just one property that has now. We don't know what's happening with the bond farm. Why put it up on the market right now? It might not. You know that might kill it. We just don't know. So that's my point. Thank you all for having me. And, uh, We've got lots of good people here to put all this into effect, so that's the good news. Um, our last speaker is Shaquille Dalal. He is the president of Launch Longmont Housing, a grassroots organization convincing the public of the power we have to make housing affordable and transportation options available. Shaquille is passionate about community service, serving on the board of trustees of the Longmont Community Foundation the City of Longmont Police Review Board as an opinion writer for the Longmont Observer from 2018 to 2020 and on the Board of Advisors of Longmont Public Media until 2023. Shakia. Sorry, I needed a second. I'm shorter than Doug. <laughs> 
Good evening. It's a pleasure and a privilege to be here tonight, and I want to thank the organizers, Sarah and Cheryl, for inviting me, uh, and to extend this invitation for, to speak to you about my vision for the future. I would like to ask you a simple question and convince you of its radical implications. My goal is to leave you this evening filled with determination and an eagerness for change. Why does Longmont exist? Humans have been building cities since before history was recorded. Their scope and scale has changed as we have changed, but the concept of a city is one of humanity's greatest technologies on the scale of fire or the wheel. Humans are social creatures who rely on each other for survival. We cooperate and we compete, and through the relationships that we establish with each other, we thrive. The city is a social and relational technology it is the ecosystem that humans construct for themselves as a beaver builds a dam, an ant builds a colony, or a bird builds a nest. The smallest cities may have just 10 people. Our largest cities have millions. But as ecosystems, they have many features in common. Cities provide safety from wild animals and the elements. They provide venues for trade and opportunities to find mates. There are places where we can gather food. They provide communal support while we raise our children, and they improve our quality of life. Why do cities exist? The answer is simple. Cities are for people. And if cities are for people, then my simple but radical belief is that we should design them in ways that improve the lives of people. The core insight of city as technology and ecosystem is no different than the other ecosystems of animals. Humans are unique among animals in terms of the complexity of the ecosystem that we build for ourselves, but our reliance on environment is the same. All life relies on its environment. The interconnected webs that make life work are mind-bogglingly complex, relying on cooperation between an unbelievable diversity of plants, animals, and structures that combine to create a whole that is greater than the sum of its parts. These interconnected webs bring resilience and adaptation with the passage of time. When ecosystems are stressed through natural disaster or population growth or epochal climate change, the strongest ecosystems are capable of changing to meet the needs of life within it. Ecosystems are always changing, whether through the seasons or the constant cycle of life and death or birth and decomposition. What happens when stress occurs is that change happens. It is just a question of what type of change. In the early 20th century, humans undertook an experiment unlike any other in our entire recorded or unrecorded history. Industrialization changed, the very, changed very nearly every aspect of human life and changed a couple of the ways that we had conceptualized cities. We radically transformed the way that we thought about cities and change the way that we designed and constructed the ecosystem that we live in. Many of these changes were for the good. Electricity, fire safety, and sanitation were worth the effort. But one of the results of that experiment is that we created systems that arrested the ability of cities to change to our needs. We stripped them of the diversity of form and function in the name of standardization. We created rules for zoning, and street widths, and established places that were reserved only for cars and never for people. We built entire subdivisions all at once, with a monoculture of identical, modular, financializable homes and powerful HOAs to enforce petty design standards. For those who can't or won't comply, we grudgingly allow tents under bridges with a constant threat of displacement through violence. These are symptoms of the most ironic version of humanity's dereliction of its responsibility to protect the environment for all life on Earth. If cities are ecosystems for humans, then what we have built up for ourselves is a factory farm. Is it any wonder that we are a society in distress? Our levels of physical activity are at an all-time low, and so is our physical and mental health. The Surgeon General of the United States recently declared loneliness an epidemic. We spend more time inside or in private spaces like our homes or in cars because other people seem far away. The community groups that, one defined, that once defined American life are growing smaller and grayer, and 20% of men report that they have zero friends. Our neighborhoods are structured for nuclear families, 
and are so expensive that living near extended family is mostly for the rich or the crowded. We commute long distances in single occupancy vehicles to a job where we spend one quarter of our working hours just to pay for the car that we use to get there. Our cities, especially our best ones, have become unaffordable for the very people who they should best serve. We salted the earth, requiring young people to flee the places that they were born or raised just so they can find somewhere to put, they can afford to put down roots. 41,000 people were killed by motor vehicle crashes in the United States in 2023. If Boeing had killed 41,000 people last year, they would already be bankrupt. So why do we allow our streets to be designed for slaughter at the hands of GM, Ford, Chrysler, and Tesla? Everyone recognizes the moral abomination of living in a country where the leading cause of death of children is gun violence. So what does it mean when our transportation system usually kills more children than guns? Our level of outrage should not depend on whether a child dies from malice or neglect. Our cities must change. Longmont must change. And we must act with the same sense of urgency that we wish we would have had 20 years ago. Longmont should have lots of people from lots of different walks of life. Just as diversity brings strength to a prairie grassland, it brings strength to a city. That means anyone of any income should be able to find a home here. Those homes must be affordable. They must come in a variety of shapes and sizes, ranging from studio apartments with supportive services for those who need them, to multi-generational homes with private and shared spaces for four families. We will have to change laws. We will have to build more homes. It should be possible to live a full life in Longmont without owning a car. Home, work, play, school and groceries. Whether that's because of how much owning a car costs, or because it's good for the environment, or because cars are isolating. Every person should have access to nutritious food in their neighborhood within walking distance of their home. We will need to build bike lanes, and public transit systems, and neighborhood grocery stores, and coffee shops, and veterinarians, and parks. We need to thoughtfully and deliberately integrate nature into our neighborhoods. Longmont should support families. On a beautiful spring day, the air should be filled with the laughter of children playing in the street because their parents aren't worried about them getting hit by a car. When those children grow up, they should be able to afford a place to live so that they can raise a family and grow old in the same place their parents did before them. Finally, and perhaps most difficult of all, we must change the culture. We must challenge the notion that a better quality of life for someone new diminishes the quality of life for someone old. We must challenge the notion that rigid engineering requirements are the best design guide for the places that we live. We must challenge the notion that Longmont is the private property of any one person or neighborhood or constituency that seeks to protect its own interests at the cost the rest of us, the rest of us must pay. We inherited Longmont from those that came before us, and we have a responsibility to those who will come after. There is much work for us to do and it will take time, but we have done hard things before. Longmont is, today, a great place to live if you can afford it. It got that way because the Longmonters of the past invent, invested in the future. Having our own electricity uh, utility, a green belt, and next life, these things did not happen on their own. Their faith in us created the high quality of life that we now reserve for the people who can afford to live within city limits. The best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. The second best time is today.